If you haven't met me before, I'm Tony. Um, I'm a pastor of one of the pastors of the church, and uh, love to be with you here today. Welcome to our church, and uh, it'd be great if you uh, became part of the family and uh, meet some friends. And, and while you're here in Kingers, um, make us your home, and uh, that would be good. I want to tell you a little bit of story about myself when I first became a Christian. Um, I had to learn how what to do with my enemies. Um, and uh, this was new for me because um, I won't even go into what I would do, you know, with my enemies before that. But I was 18 years old and I became a Christian and I was working at Sizzler Toowoomba. Has anyone eaten at Sizzler Toowoomba? I'm sorry for you. I apologise. But uh, when uh, I had worked there since I was 15 or 14 and nine months or whatever it was, and uh, and it it had been going gangbusters, right? Some of you who ate there back in the day, you, there would literally be a 40 metre line out the door to eat there, and um, and then. But by the time I was 18, um, the shine on the Sizzler franchise was starting to wane, and they weren't making the money that they made, and so um, they sent some managers through a number of the uh, Queensland-owned um, stores. They started there, and just to shake things up a bit and ship people out, and uh, because they needed to, you know, bring that profit margin, you know. Back up, and one of the ways, of course, in corporate settings, they like to do that is by taking uh, wages out of the equation. And so, this particular general uh, uh, manager came in, and uh, and like a fire, just flew through um, all of the staff. And uh, in and day one, I think three staff had gone day one. And um, and no, see, they didn't tell us this was happening. It just this fellow just appeared, and uh, and so I was working as the sh- as the cook, short order cook at the time, just flipping steaks and fish and chicken and you know whatever um, hot food came out. I was in charge of the hot food section at the time, and uh, it's quite it can be quite stressful, high volume cooking like that, and uh, that's where I cut my teeth um, in cooking. And uh, I would arrive in the morning, I'd do the preparation for the day at six o'clock and here this general manager would stand watching everyone clock in. Remember the old clock in? Some of you might still have it. But he would stand back about two metres and watch everyone clock in. And if you clocked in late, um, he, you would get your first warning. If you clocked in late from lunches, you would get your first warning. Um, and, and so he just had a couple of methods that he was using uh, to do that. And anyway, he seemed to leave me alone for the first week. Uh, but then, it, I guess it was on his processes, he made his, made his way to the um, hot meal preparation section, which, you know, was a grill... Uh, very large grill fryers and, and a preparation area to serve out. And um, so the next week, um, he actually followed me the whole time. And uh, he asked me all these questions and he um, criticised some of my uh, work. Um, and it was, uh, it, was, it, was para- it was sort of really paralysing to me having this person here just... Pre- yeah, the pressure was on already like serving a couple hundred people in a meal period. But this guy was on me. Like I knew, I, I just knew that he was out to remove me from that spot because I was the supervisor of that spot. I was only 18 and he, he thought, I, I'm, he just wouldn't get rid of me. And um, I was like, uh, initially uh, it was very difficult for me uh, because the old man one was coming back and I just thought um, I could wait for him at about... 10 o'clock on close, um, pretty dark at the back parking lot that time of year and I could just flip and nail this guy and we'd get this done and dusted. That would have probably got me directly you know, to the magistrate and he would have you know, given me his opinion about that. Um, so I'm glad I didn't do that. Instead, um, he... Uh, he was really fanatical about having this hour lunch break and coming out. So at lunchtime, I would jump on my pedally um, and I would just race back to the unit that I was living in and I would pray. And my, I can be honest with you, the, pray, the prayers were, were 
self-motivated initially. They were like, God, can you get rid of this guy? I just need him gone. I don't know how you do that. You've, you know, you smote people before. Is that a thing? I don't know. But I can't live with this. Anyway, over a couple of weeks, my prayer, uh, you know, my prayer, the good thing about it, my prayer life went through the roof, right? Because <laughs> the only way I could show up to work was like spend half an hour each lunchtime praying for this guy. Um, and, um, you know, that, that went on. It seems like months and months, and I know it's only about six to eight weeks. Uh, and over that time, I just, my prayers transformed. And my heart for him transformed. And it was like it took the whole six weeks, right? It was like, okay, this guy, he, he wants to make an enemy of me, but I'm not making an enemy of him. I got no more enemy left in me for this guy. And so I just, I, I changed my tra- track and I just smile. One time he, he threatened to sack me because I was smiling at him. I can get it because I was a bit of a cheeky bugger as a kid, right? But I wasn't being cheeky, I'm telling you now. I wasn't being cheeky. I was just like, man, no matter what you do, I'm not going to make an enemy of you. Um, And it was one of my first real, I think, mature moments in my life, you know, where um, I felt that there was fruit from this. And I got to this place and then you know what happened? He left. I had to do all that work, all that spiritual growth, all of that prayer. And without telling anybody, he just left. And we all rocked up and we're all like, I want to say his name. Where is... Uh, He's gone. And he took off to the Gold Coast sizzler. And I was just like... I wasn't celebrating, right? But I'm telling you, there was a lot of staff that were who managed to keep their job. What, what do I do with my enemy? That's a big question for you and I as Christians. Uh, you know, learning to be in God's presence means, first of all, learning to make friends with God. The great thing about that is Jesus was friends with sinners, people who didn't, meet the religious expectation of the so-called people who knew God. In fact, the people who knew God in Jesus' day, the Pharisees and Sadducees, they had lots of rules about, especially about your money, about how you'd give money to the temple and different places, what you would do with food. They had a lot of things. Um, they, made it, uh, uh, they made it their thing to let everybody know about how to conduct yourself Um, with the law, and those that didn't meet that standard, which was a lot of people, and a lot of them who couldn't meet that standard were actually impoverished, like they they didn't have anything, they didn't have a lot. And so um, in the idea that the sinners and the poor people were very similar was literally a sociological problem that the people had. Because it's like, well, we, you know, we don't have any money. We've got some bit of food. And they were taught, told about how they would have to tithe off their herbs and spices even. And the Pharisees would show the people, you know, I've got these herbs and spices. Oh, you know, I've got, to, I've got to tithe off everything. You know, I've got to be this person that they want me to be. Um, and Jesus comes into um, the world in this time with a very different perspective And I think it's definitely as disciples of Jesus Christ, we need to follow in his footsteps uh, with this. Uh, I want to, if you want to go there with your Bible or your phone or whatnot, we're going to go to Matthew um, chapter 9 and starting in verse 9. And Jesus calls one of his disciples at the moment. And this is the calling of this disciple who was seen as an enemy of the Jewish people. He was a tax collector. He was seen, and so who was he he collecting taxes for? Rome, and Rome was the enemy. 
all right? So he was a collaborator with the occupying army of Rome upon the, upon the Jewish people. And so Jesus was about to call this collaborator into the kingdom of God. And not only that, see, Jesus as a, um, as a teacher himself, were, disciples were called to teach others. So he was calling Matthew not only into a place of friendship with him, but he was actually calling him to a teaching ministry. He was going to go on to be someone um, in the kingdom of God who would set the standard and, uh, for, uh, for the people of God. And so verse 9 says this, As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. It's where tax collectors hang out. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with collectors and sinners? It's not on. On hearing this, Jesus said, it is not is it sorry it is not the healthy who need a doctor but the sick but go and learn what this means jesus has a meaning to this story i desire mercy not sacrifice for i have not come to call the righteous they're already sweet, but sinners. Are you ready for this? You're not sure, so I'm going to pray. Lord God, today, would you just lead us and guide us? Lord, your people, your followers here today. Lord, may we love to, may we live to learn to love. even our enemies. God, today we need your Holy Spirit. Come. Reveal to us how this works. Show us how to love God. Show us how to love people. Show us how to love ourselves. Lord, let this spirit of revelation and knowledge deepen our ties and our connection and our relationship with you today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> I just, uh, I'm, I'm going to sort of deal with a couple of things today in relation to this. And, and hopefully, uh, this is always, uh, it's not a conversation when I'm up here. But it's certainly if you have questions and you want to converse with me um, after, I'll be available here at church. And we can talk through some of the things that may may arise or an issue for you. The, the, the first things um, I, I want to say about this, or make an observation, our disciples of Jesus aren't called to make enemies. They're not called to make war. Or conflict. But are called to love their neighbour. So how are we going to go about that? I just, um, I'm, I'm still in Psalm 23. I don't know where I'm going to get dislodged from it, but let's read it again today. Um, and uh, it'll come up on the screen shortly. We can say it together if you like. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. Is that raha? Raha. That means basically harm. I won't fear harm. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. That's really important. We're going to come back to that one. What does he prepare? He prepares a table. Strange. 
prepares a table before me. Why does he do it in front of his enemies? Mm. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. Keep that table mind in your, in your thoughts, right? God's going to prepare a table. Who's on the other side of the table? The enemies. Right? Me, the table, my enemies. But they're there. They're present. This isn't in the sermon, right? But I'm wondering who invited them. Like, did the wife mix up the invitations? Who invited them? But they're there. I, I want to make this. Um, part, I want to. I, I got some things as a pastor just on my heart for the people, right? Can let's check up that next slide there. Let's start making war on the people of this world. Our enemy is spiritual. All right. Paul nailed this in Ephesians. I'm not going to go into it, but if you want to go into Ephesians um, 5 and 6, work that one out. Our, uh, this, this war that we wage isn't against flesh and blood, but it's against powers and principalities and authorities who, who work against the will of God and against the people of God. Okay? Uh, the, the issue around this is, uh, let, let's talk about, I've made a comment there about religious spirit, so I want to acknowledge um, and just give just a little teaching. And, and some people might have more questions about it, but um, I'm just going to give a line. Like a religious spirit is a powerful spiritual authority, not from God, that seeks to control and, def and, and destroy faith. So a religious spirit, I'm not talking about you having a spirit in you, like a, a possession. I'm talking about those powers and principalities and, and, and of heavenly realms that actually influence the world where we're at. They want to speak. They want to get authority. They want to, get, uh, they want to um, create value systems. They want to create um, thoughts and ideas that set, set themselves up against the knowledge of God, against you coming into a personal relationship with God. They are always speaking to the world. They're always influencing people through media, through anything you hear. That's how... Uh, that's how these authorities work, through what you hear. Because what you hear filters through your um, brain, it through, filters through your, uh, the patterns of who you are, and it gets into your heart. And then you begin to operate out that and it becomes a wild circle. right? So a religious spirit always wants to make enemy, make, raise enemies in the world. There's an enemy of your soul. Right? His name is Satan. But if he gives you and I the job, Satan doesn't have to worry about it. Because we're at war with one another. We make enemies with one another. And so that's what a religious spirit is always trying to do, is trying to set up itself against the people of God. Don't be a Christian who sets yourself up against the people of God because you think you are right. You need to address the spiritual authority above your world that's speaking into your heart and your mind. Okay. And so that's not a judgment. That's me just speaking into this, this atmosphere of the spiritual world over our city that does have religious spirits and political spirits trying to influence his people. So as, as a pastor and a shepherd, I want you to understand, right, that when we as Christians set ourselves up as enemies against people, that isn't actually the spirit of Christ. The spirit of Christ is drawing people. The religious spirit wants to keep everyone at arm. You're over there and you're the enemy. 
That's why in this church, you can come to me with your politics and you can talk to me on your politics, but I honestly, uh, you may as well keep it to yourself because I don't have anything political to say to you. Now, be very careful with politics, friend. We live in a, we live in a, a society where we get to vote and we get to have our say and we have that right. And, and I believe every one of us should exercise that right while we have it because a whole lot of brothers and sisters all over the world don't have it. It just so happens that we live in a society that does. Be wise, be prayerful uh, as you go into that, but it is not what leads our life. The spirit of this world does not lead our life. Jesus is the government of your heart. And he needs to remain the government of your heart. He is the king of your heart. So we, we ought to be wise because what happens is when people divide against one another, stand against one another, we create divisions. And we're working on this all the time with each other. So we don't really need a lot more of it. What's God's answer to the enemies is he prepares a table. Uh, what, as Christians, are we going to do in this space instead? Let's learn to prepare tables. Let's learn to prepare tables. Eating with someone in ancient Israel signifies a covenant of friendship. Like we're not making war when we're at the table. For a start, you're reclined. You can't get your sword out. When you're reclined at the table, it's like, who's going to be the, you know, when you're reclining on your pillows, I wish I had some pillows here, and it's like, you're getting upset. It's like, who's like first to get this? You know, no, the, you don't take your sword to the table. It's a covenant, and we're going to be friends here. We're going to learn to refriend, refriend the people that God has. We're not refriending the world and the spirit of this world. James talks about not befriending the spirit of this world. But you've got to remember, God died for every person in the world. What? We all know how John 3.16, for God so loved the world, every person in the world, even the worst one, every person. In Judaism, some believed eating with such company of sinners, that's why they were unimpressed with Jesus, believed eating with such company conveyed an acceptance of their sin. If I sit down and covenant with them, I accept their sin. Jesus preferred pursuing relationships that might lead sinners to God rather than separating himself from them. We see the difference going on here. See, we've got to understand the difference between worldliness and people in the world. Because Jesus come for them. And do you know who he sent? The Holy Spirit to live in you, that you then may be the one who befriends those people. To love them. To what? Love one another. Like the Good Samaritan. Like the Pharisee was on about it again. Questions Jesus, who's my neighbour then? And he does the Good Samaritan parable. The one who's unlovable, the one who's wounded, the one who's sort of put aside, the one who everyone else puts aside. Next slide. Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it's not, health, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire to be merciful. So the Pharisees are all worried about getting the sacrifice right for me. Now, bringing a sacrifice of praise to God is right. Living your life in obedience before God and giving up what you need to is right. But when it comes to other people, you don't make them sacrifice, you give them mercy. He says, well, you should, you should sacrifice for me. No, we call that 
service. And it's voluntary. The Pharisees were all up in their business about what you should have been given, what you should have been doing right. They're all up in your business about all your ethics and all that sort of stuff. What's right and wrong? It's interesting when you get up in Jesus' business, you get up into loving people. You get up into how, do I f- how does he face the gr- one of the greatest uh, people in the land who are about to uh, have the power to execute him at his crucifixion. He's before the, the king of that area and he's made friends with him. Why do you think, if you read, you, you read the account, this guy has spent time with Jesus and instead of Jesus pointing judgment at him, why does, why does it... He actually comes to befriend this guy. This guy, this king wants to, you know, he wants to set this aside. Like, I don't see any judgment. I don't see any guilt in this person. I want to let him go. Why don't we let this guy go? As was part of their tradition, they had the capacity to let one of them go. And what? The crowd, no, they wanted to get Jesus. They just wanted to get him. They were just like, get him, get that sinner. Let's crucify him. We've got to be careful, folks, that we're not, the, we're not that happy, clappy group that want to crucify the, the, um, our friendly new age people in one day or crucify the local politician. We want to crucify, you know, the local whatever, brothel. We want to just crucify him. I don't think we've got a brothel in it. I actually don't know. But... Don't tell me if you do know. But let's just crucify him. Because we made enemies. So we can't discern. It's like the Holy Spirit's in you telling you what's right and what's wrong. It's like you don't, you're not running around. It's like, oh dear, I'm going to become a prostitute if I come near them. Or do you know what I mean? We set up this protection in our world and we make them enemies. Verse 43. Next slide. (coughs) Matthew 5. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbour and hate your enemies. (laughs) I was trying to find out where they got that one from. That's a bit complicated how these... Pharisees got to that. But I tell you, Jesus is correcting it, love your enemies, pray for your enemies, pray for them, and pray for those who persecute you. Whew. Wow, Jesus has just gone off his rocker. That you may be children of your Father in heaven. Why? Because you see the Son do what he did. He, he took it. He took all the punishment, all the sin. All his enemies were against him. He prayed for them. Even when I was on the cross, he was befriending a crook on the cross where he should have been like, yeah, buddy, I know where you're going. I'll be there in a couple of days and we'll chat before I go up to, you know. He should have been going to hell for all his crimes. And Jesus is on the cross making friends with the criminal. And I find it hard to make friends with my mother-in-law. God bless you, Grace, if you're watching this. If you, I'm going to pay for that, I think. That, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the... And the what? God must really love everyone. Why would he do that? If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? And not even the tax collectors, those collaborators who should be killed. Aren't they even doing that? And if you greet only your own people, you know, I'm good with my family. You know, I can love my family. I do it for my family. What are you doing more than others? 
I love this. Even the pagans are doing that. Can you say that with me? Pagan. Pagan. Those who don't believe, right? (laughs) They're non-Jewish people he's talking about. That's actually me. I'm a pagan until I come into the kingdom of God and I got made righteous and become one of his children. So then I no longer am a pagan. He goes this, be perfect. Therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect. We're going to learn a bit about this perfection. Perfect is not that you don't have anything wrong with you. Perfect is that uh, perfection is an agronomical term about that uh, harvest has come to its full fruition. It's mature. It's ready to harvest. It's ripe. In other words, it's matured. What comes off a matured plant? Fruit, grain, whatever. It's about to drop what it's, what it's actually created for. And you are actually created to love God and you're created to love one another. Me too. Isn't that cool? That's what you're created to do. So when I am operating at my best, when, I'm op- when I come into a place of maturity, I'm coming into that place where I can operate in loving relationships and that I can refriend people. So like if, you, if I've got a problem with you, um, my, my spirituality, my relationship with God is about me learning how to refriend you. If you've got a problem with me, your maturity uh, in Christ is about you learning to how to refriend me. And how quickly you can go about doing that will determine uh, within those processes will help you begin to outwork and live in the flow of God's love. God's love will begin to flow through you. Because you've got friends, man. You've got friends. Have I got this coming up? Uh, I sort of just want to, I need to, I want to fast forward to this table thing. Where is it? Anyway, I'm going to go back to the table. We talked a bit about the covenant of the table, right? So when I sit down at the table, I'm making a friend. I'm making a covenant with you. A table is fellowship. A table is where we're united. We're going to work out our differences. You know, can you work out, you can work out your differences at the table. You know what the table was for the Jewish people? It was on uh, the table, especially around the Sabbath. The Sabbath was all about the meals that they sat down with together. Right? That's why they took a day off. They took a day off and they'd talk God. And every meal had a purpose and they would tell, the meal would tell about the uh, exploits of the Jewish people and what God did amongst the Jewish people and then what he did in Egypt. And then the next meal, they would teach another aspect of God about uh, the prophets uh, and the kings. And the next meal, they... Now, I don't know all the exacts in and out. If you want to know all the exacts in and outs of each of the meals and what they're, but they would sit at a table and it was about having a relationship with God and it was about having a relationship with one another and we weren't working. You see, work wasn't going to be like it was in Israel. It wasn't going to be the thing that chained us. And so they said, no, we're going to give a day where we're not going to be chained to work. We're not going to be chained to uh, the pursuit of money and the pursuit of prosperity. We're going, to, um, we're, going to cha- we're, we're going to bring the family together and we're going to love one another and we're going to speak about the things of God. You see, there's this table where it was an intimacy about coming together. We have to sit at a table. We have to sit at a table. Well, parenting tip. If you've got, if you've got kids growing up with kids, have dinner at a table. Every night. Don't sit down just in front of the TV every night when you're eating. Sit down and sit at the table with one another and look at one another in the eye eye and and relate and talk and take that flipping iPad and throw it in your bedroom, you know, where they they can't get it and, and be together. Be close to one another. I love this table. So he said to God said, the great host of heaven said, you guys don't have to worry because I'm going to set a table before you. And what he was saying, I'm, your, I'm making a covenant of friendship with you. I used to think it was like this. You see, no, nah, no, nah, God's on my side and not on your side. 
And so don't mess with me because God sets the table. He's my friend. But you know, on the other side of the table, the enemies are too. What are they doing here? Get out! This is my table! Actually, what he's meaning is this, is, hey, do you guys want to come and sit at my table? I like to think that, you know, God is on my side and he would just, uh, you know, he's on my side. That's why the enemies over there would be like, look at me, huh? You suck. I'm good. And we do that, like, sort of with our Christianity. It's like, you know, getting around in the world. It's like, yes, I'm getting through the world and I'm going to heaven and you're going to hell. Sucks to be you. You wouldn't even say that, I hope. <laughs> no, it's like you can come. Hey, we can invite them to the table. I want to be your friend. I want to live, make it. Like, you know what? Take as, you know, I reckon take as many friends to heaven with you as you possibly can. Take as many. The, the problem with that is, as you, uh, if every person on the planet's your enemy, you make an enemy, this person, that person, that person, because they don't share the same ideal, they don't, don't do this and they don't, don't, don't do that, uh, and you're going to heaven and you ain't got any friends with you because they're all enemies. It's like, no, come on. That's not, that's not the people of God. That's not, that's not even Jesus. That's not us. That's not who we are. We're called to befriend the people, to love upon them, for them to learn what it is to come close to us again. You know, I know this. We've got all sorts of factors that are in the way of that happening, you know. But another thing that a religious spirit does, it wants to judge. That'll keep, that, that'll keep us apart for sure, right, when I'm being judgy. Stop judging one another. Who made you judge anyway? I was looking in the mirror when I was saying that, right? So, original religious spirit wants you to live condemned. That's what religious spirit says. You're condemned. There's nothing good in you. Their idea of God is that. The old smiting God. Oh, how the world would be just so good. Without evil, God will come and smite them. Now, I'm making a bit of a joke of that, but you and I have been there. That general manager who wanted to get rid of me. I had smite prayers. <laughs> Friends, let's not smite prayers. The people at Wandai doing their gem thing. How about you invite them to a table instead? Please don't be out there flipping, jumping up and down, trying to cast demons out of them. They experience the love of God and demons will run in a second, friend. Whoo! A religious spirit wants you to condemn others for their sin. All of the people gathering around to stone the girl who committed adultery. Woohoo! What stone have I got? Give me the big one. Oh, how much does that one cost? We just want, woo, we're just going to condemn. Religious spirit loves that. Just loves to say how right they are and wrong everyone else is. And uh, You know, we've all operated under that. We've all operated under that. But God doesn't want us to operate under it anymore. Because that just, it's not inviting people to the table. You know, I don't know why Jesus picked Matthew. Why would you pick the most unpopular kid? Like, it just it doesn't commute to me. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a competitive team player. Like, I'm, I'm selecting the kids for the basketball. I don't take little short Johnny, who's like, 
You know, I want the best, fittest, strongest player on my team. Matthew's a collaborator. All the other people, they want to kill him. You're picking him. Jesus, what are you picking that character for? You know what? Jesus looked past Matthew's sin and saw a mighty man of God. He was calling him as a disciple. He was saying, you're going to be my protege, mate. Why do you think Matthew dropped everything and ran after it? Matthew didn't even believe he could be that. Matthew didn't believe. His people hated him. Matthew didn't even believe that. Jesus comes along and says, I'm going to make you a great teacher. And he dumped everything and said, I'm following you. That was the next scripture. We saw it. Jesus went from where he was and he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Like Jesus ain't, you know, he's not blind like me. Like he sees who he is and looks straight through it and sees the man of God. You know, that, that's what Jesus is calling us to do. We've got to see beyond what you right there. You know, that, ew. You know, I've been working in environments sometimes um, over the last sort of three or four months. I'm just like, whoa. I'm like, Jesus calls us to look past the sin. Past the ugly Past the names that have been called. Don't listen to the people gossiping about that business in Kingaroy. I've heard some things recently of people just flipping, bagging businesses, coming out of Christian mouths. You know, please let that not be Highway Church. If you've got a poor opinion about business in Kingaroy, can I pastorally and lovingly say you don't speak a word about it? Right? It's not your place to judge. It's not, we don't want to be the gospers in town. The goody two shooter gospel. Is that right? Oh, whatever. Good, goody two shoes. Gossipers. It's like, man. Now let's set a table. Give them an extra 10% tax. So they don't have to give it to the tax man. Whoa, is that the time already? Everyone's like, when is this guy going to finish? Muso's better come. <laughs> Stop giving in to unbridled biology. <laughs> I'm going to not go, I'm not going to stay this here. Like, you know, your body and your biology and your brain system, they're all wired up. But you've got this thing going on in your head that's wired up to discern enemies, right? Because you, you want to fight them or you want to take off from them. You've got to be very careful because your memory, it all happens in that right-hand side that is faster than your conscious thought. So how you act when an enemy comes is a, like last night, um, we'd, it wasn't a scary show, but we, had, we were watching a show and I was sitting next to Joe, which is a bad idea when there's, if there's a, because like this, uh, and she goes, Whoa! and you've got to watch out, she flip and knock you out. Because <laughs> her immediate reaction is like one of, you know, because she lives in a more calm world. And we got, we got this biology stuff going on in our world that we react to. And we sort of, we make people enemies. In that same area, it's like your memories. And we make decisions off these memories and past. And it's like, oh, these religious, oh, these pastors do this. And oh, Christians do that. And, and husbands do this. And men do that. And girls do this. And, and in an instant, you know, react out of it. And within there, God has created all these passions and desires as well as human beings. You know, and that's wonderful. You know, He put these passions and desires in us, um, you know, to eat, to drink, be merry, make love, all those things. But they need the direction of a loving God who gives them the context for their use for us to love one another and to be able to befriend each other. You know, things, we've got an 18 plus, oh, we don't have an 18 plus. They're doing something else. It's like the stuff in your bedroom. 
It's to love one another, right? Not to bring harm to one another, but to love one another. It's mutual and consensual. And it brings glory to your partner and to, and to God. And it's active and it's passionate. It's always seeking out one another. Ah, I don't know. That was a freebie, right? That wasn't in the notes. Okay. Verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such love there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. It's talking about not being obedient to God. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Self-control, friends. Self-control before we gossip. Self-control before we get angry. Self-control. These passions. I know there's some passionate people amongst you. These passions have context and they have self-control. And then we can be friends with one another. We're not doing it for our own end, right? This is about how we get close to God. Sabbath, we get close to one another. We can even get close to our, You know what this closeness does? It makes you aware. Right? When you're close, you are more aware. It's one of the, going on about presence, presence, presence. There's God everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's times when you're more aware, right? So I've been up there. You've been aware of me saying my funny stuff. And hopefully it didn't offend anyone. Like, you're more aware now, right? Tony's here. <laughs> Does he smell all right? <laughs> Oi! I know I can punch the plumber in the arm. He's, just, he won't punch me back. He's a good guy. <laughs> I, I can't punch you though, right? Okay. You're probably a bit more aware of me now, right? Because I'm close. Is this a bit awkward? <laughs> Oh, I just got to stay away from you awkward people. No, no, that's just jokes. I'm going to get close. How do I get close? I've got to take a step towards it. Like you might be here today and think, oh, how do I get close to God? It's by faith you've got to start with prayer. That's how you take a step towards it. You've got to take a step towards Jesus. You can't get close to God without Jesus. You've got to take a step towards giving your heart to Him. You've got to take a step towards intimacy and closeness with Him. You need to start reading some stuff about Him. we got this thing called the Bible. You, need to, you, know, you can find out more about Him in there. But you need to pray about Him. That's how you get it. And you'll meet Jesus' people. That's, how, that's just as important as the other two. You'll find Jesus in the friendship of those who love God and meant to love you. As you go, I'm just going to get a bit closer. I know Ken, Ken loves being close. Get a bit closer. Get all up in your business. I know this guy doesn't know much. I don't know. But because we're friends, <laughs> I'm going to get in his business. <laughs> oh, this guy's thinking, stay away from me. <laughs> They're saying, keep going, buddy. Literally. Dan, Dan's all right. I know you. You want to just give me a big hug. See? Anytime, pal. Friends. Friends. You know, I, t- I know there's a time, yeah, there's times where I, where I may not seem a bit friendly. I may seem a bit sticky. I know John likes a good cuddle, good friends. You know, what's wrong with Tony? Oh, no. What's wrong with that bloke? Hi, <laughs> oh, dear. Good to see you. Bless you. So you get close. I know I can safely get closer to Glenda. <laughs> She's going to love me. We do the same with God. It's about this awareness. It's also about, you know, being aware of yourself. Learning to love yourself is about being aware of, you know, aware of yourself. Being God aware, like being aware of the maturity level. Being aware of, oh, gee, that, that didn't come out. Who am I? Beginning to ask those questions. God, who am I? You created me. And then when we get this, we get close, tables close. Bring those people in close. It's all up in your business and it's awkward. How awkward.
awkward was the conversation with Jesus and the lady at the well. She had five had five husbands and she was with the one who's not. And Jesus having this sort of awkward like, yeah, like, yeah, you're here today. And um, yeah, you're right. You did, you know. And five husbands laying and one you're not with. And, you know, it's awkward. It's awkward. Jesus shouldn't have been talking to her for a start. Jesus is a bit awkward. Because when Jesus comes into your world, He gets up in your business. If Jesus hadn't got up in your business lately, you've probably got Him at arm's length. And we begin to see Him as your enemy. Jesus, don't get in my business. Oh, see, right? Don't get in business. Don't get in my business. That's too close. I felt times like that. I've had friends say stuff to me and I'm like, get out of my business. But they said it to me because they love me. When we allow Jesus into that close place, when we allow each other into that, love begins to flow. And that's why the psalmist talks about, you anoint me with oil, my cup overflows. Because the love of God begins to flow through us. Even our enemies are experiencing our love, you know. And I'm like, I'm preaching to me more than anyone else in this building. I want, my lo- I want the love of God to flow through me. I know I'm going to work on not making enemies, but refriend. I want to. I need to learn to befriend. I need to learn to refriend. I ain't gonna. Re, I'm not gonna friend the devil. He's trying to steal from me. He's trying to kill my kids. He's trying to take away my faith. But I'm gonna love the people. I'm gonna get. Uh, and it gets messy when you get up in each other's business. And like if you get up in my business, it's gonna get messy too. But the love gets to flow because the mercy of God. Why don't we stand to our feet? John fifteen. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friend. You are my friends, if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants, because a servant doesn't know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends. For everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command. Love one another. Love. What's flowing out of our cups, church? You know what I'm like? I felt the Spirit of the Lord say, you're going to teach people how to love their enemies. I'm like, that's crazy. How can you teach people to love people they hate? Give that job to someone else, God. And he's like, no, you're right. You just teach it. Let me work on their hearts. And, 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 and as I said that, I was like, I came under the power, the power of the Holy Spirit came upon me. And I was like, oh my goodness, God, I gotta teach me how to love my enemies. Teach me how to make heaps and heaps of friends. Teach me how to be in people's business, you know, in that place. Re, retrain me, God. Because what coming out of my cup, let it be the anointing of God that brings people close, close to the presence of God, close to each other. And then we know the presence. Then we experience the presence, the presence of God. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. My cup overflows. We just welcome you here today, Jesus. We welcome you, Father. I, I, I today want you to fill me, Holy Spirit. I, I, I just, that's my heart's desire.
Holy Spirit, come and fill your people. Fill the cup, fill, the, fill our life with love and mercy, Lord God, for uh, the, those who seem to be on the outside of your kingdom. Lord, may love and mercy flow, that they feel the anointing, they feel your touch, they feel your presence, they feel your forgiveness, your grace, your smile upon them. May they know what it is to have Almighty God smile upon them and love upon them. Lord God, that the cup would overflow and, and and, and it would flow all over their lives, into their families, with their kids, with everything, Lord, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. And no mountain, no harm before us, no harm before us can stop us from this great mission that you've called your church to in the name of Jesus. And Lord God, we will speak to the mountains and we will speak to the valleys and we will speak uh, uh, to that uh, which would uh, Stop us and we will declare that God's love is following me, that the shepherd is here guiding me, that he'll take me uh, through all things uh, and he's got a hold of me in the name of Jesus. If we could just put that chorus up. Oh, Jesus, love you and adore you. I will praise you on a mountain, God. I will praise you. someone to stand and pray with you. The prayer team will be here with you. And uh, they'll be here to bless you and not judge you.